today on Let the Bible Speak. We continue the series Innovations and the Divine Pattern today with a look at Sunday school and divided Bible classes. When did that practice begin and does it match God's pattern for teaching the church? Stay with us. That's today's topic on Let the Bible Speak. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Kevin Presley. And thanks for being with us today. I'm Kevin Presley, and it's a great pleasure to be with you to study the Bible for a while today. In recent weeks, we've been talking about the Bible pattern and departures from that pattern throughout the centuries. It's an important theme for our day and time because since the time of its establishment, the church has morphed into something unrecognizable to the church of the first century. We're pleading for a restoration of the principles and practices of the early church. Because when Christ established the church, He placed within it by means of divine revelation the things He wanted there. The apostles, by their apostolic authority, revealed the things that Jesus desired for His church to be and to do. Jesus said one time that His Word is the seed of the kingdom, according to Luke the 8th chapter. And a seed, of course, produces after its own kind. Now last week we spoke about instrumental music in the church and we saw that it took more than 600 years for it to find its way into New Testament era worship. Today we turn to an innovation that only goes back less than 250 years, the Sunday school. Most churches conduct Sunday schools and the innovation even found its way into the restoration movement. But does it matter? What is Sunday school? And is it a, a scriptural arrangement for the church to come together for edification? In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning in verse 31, the Apostle Paul corrected a number of abuses taking place in the assembly of the church at Corinth all throughout the 14th chapter. And we read beginning in verse 31, Ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Well, these verses contain some very specific guidelines and prohibitions for what is to take place when the church comes together for edification. Paul said that this is the way it was to be in the churches. We want to look at those principles today in our study about the origin and development of the modern Sunday school. We'll be back in just a moment. The psalmist said, Through thy precepts I get understanding. The Bible is the revelation of God to man. And you simply can't live for God until you know something about the Word of God. And you may say, well, I want to read and study the Bible, but I don't know where to begin. I feel overwhelmed or I don't understand the Bible. I want to offer you a wonderful way to get acquainted with the Scriptures. You'll learn about some of the most basic and foundational teachings of God's Word, and you'll get a better handle on how to read and approach and study the Bible as a whole. Won't you get in touch with us today and ask to be enrolled in the Bible Correspondence Course? It won't cost you a penny, and we'll mail the lessons to your home, and you take your time to read and study through the lessons. I think you'll be surprised how much you'll learn. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. There is joy divine that is ever mine Since the Lord has forgiven me Pardon me and thy work and sing For my blessed King By His grace I have been made free Truly free There is, there is grace for every day. For each need grace for me 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 
The Sunday School movement began in the 1780s in England. As the industrial era dawned, England had a large number of poor families who moved from the country into the city to find work. Children as young as eight years old were made to work in the English factories in very dangerous conditions. There were no free public schools as we have today, and it was left up to families to provide an education for their children. If a family had enough money, they could send their children to a school but if the family was poor, well, kids were usually raised unable to read and write, and this kept the family locked in a perpetual cycle of poverty and illiteracy. The work week was six days long, with Sunday being the only day off. And many of these poor children spent the day off roaming the streets, breaking into houses, and getting into other forms of trouble. A man named Robert Rakes had an idea, though. He thought that churches should intervene and see to it that these children received an education keeping them out of trouble, and perhaps finally breaking the cycle and lifting them out of poverty. So he thought, why not start a school on Sunday when these children are off of work where people with high morals and spiritual values could teach them to read and write and instill within them some moral principles. Thus a Sunday school was begun for the poor. Rakes reportedly donated the first money needed to get the school started, and he began to raise money for the cause. Now, Rakes was a printer, and so he printed copies of the Ten Commandments and other scriptures to use as a curriculum to teach the children how to read and write. It didn't take long for the idea to spread to other cities throughout England and eventually, well, the world. By 1811, we're told there were nearly a half million children enrolled in Sunday schools throughout Britain. The concept spread to America just before the turn of the 19th century by way of the Quakers in Philadelphia. Eventually, every church would have its own school, but it began as a cooperative effort among several churches and denominations. In each city, there might be a school to begin with to which poor students would go and receive an education. Students at Indiana Wesleyan University a few years ago documented its spread throughout the nation. And uh, in New York City, two women named Isabella Graham and her daughter, Joanna Bethune, launched an organization to promote the Sunday schools throughout the country which became a way of enabling women to take more of a leading role in religious society and in teaching the Bible in a more formal setting. Now, as you might imagine, this drew a great deal of opposition from preachers of that day and other religious leaders, some believing that it would soon lead to women becoming preachers. The women persisted, though, and the movement began to spread throughout the country. Preachers eventually, gradually, began to accept the schools, even with women teaching them, and it wasn't long until towns of just about any size had an interdenominational school mostly for poor children to be educated in. Well, as the country spread into the Wild West in the mid-1800s, the Sunday school was used to accomplish the same purpose for children in these untamed parts as was originally designed for in England. By the last part of the 19th century, there were more than 65,000 Sunday schools across America with 10 million children enrolled in them. But what began as a community effort, you might say, to train children in secular education and basic morals soon became a work of individual churches to indoctrinate children with their own religious teaching. By the late 1800s, denominations had organized their own Sunday school organizations, uh, providing religious curriculum to their churches for their local schools. In time, practically every church had its own Sunday school dividing people, particularly children, into classes to teach them the Bible. In the 20th century, these classes became an outreach for churches to expose children to their congregations, uh, many times children whose parents didn't attend church. 
and churches began sending buses throughout the community to gather up kids for their Sunday school. And all of this finally opened the way for children's church, where children could be sent to learn and worship while parents worshiped in another assembly. Now today, most churches continue to utilize the Sunday school, or perhaps they call them Bible classes, as a means of teaching the Bible to young and old. Most congregations advertise a time around their primary worship time for the church to be divided up or segregated by age or spiritual level or background in the classrooms to be taught by various teachers, men and women, and then come together for perhaps a sermon and the remaining forms of worship. That perhaps sounds like a wonderful idea, originally born of the most noble of motives, an idea now used to teach the Word of God. But is it according to the pattern? Its practice can only be traced back to 1780, and even then it was for a different purpose. But is this relatively modern practice biblical? What does the Word of God say about the assembly of the church and how the church is to edify its members when they assemble together? In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul is not only regulating the public teaching of God's Word, he's regulating the assembly as a whole. There were some major problems in the church at Corinth, and many of them pertained to what was going on in their assemblies. Their gatherings had become confusing and therefore unedifying, and their assemblies had become reasons for pride and jealousy and competition, instead of being for the good and edification of the church. With that said, do Sunday schools and Bible classes follow the pattern for the assembly of the church that Paul lays out within 1 Corinthians chapter 14? You know, the Bible places emphasis upon the teaching of the Scriptures and how that teaching is carried out. In the Old Testament dispensation, God made it clear how it was to be done. It was first to be done by families in the home. It is the primary, and always has been, the primary responsibility of mothers and fathers to instill not only secular but moral teaching within their children. And uh, that is still where the responsibility of teaching children lies today, by the way. But then God's people were to come together under the Old Testament every seven years to hear the law read to them. We read about that over in Deuteronomy chapter 31, beginning in the 11th verse. There Moses says, When all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Listen closely. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law, and that their children which have not known anything may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as ye live in the land whether ye go over Jordan to possess it. Well, several things stand out in this verse. First, the people were called together into one place to all hear the law. There wasn't a separate reading for women or a separate reading for children or any other group within the congregation. They were to come together and all be taught at one time and in one place. Second of all, it's worthy to note that God said that all of the people could benefit from the reading of the law in that one assembly. Now, some will argue that children or that perhaps new Christians cannot understand what's being taught in the pulpit, and so Bible classes are necessary to teach them. However, that wasn't the case under the law. Notice that Moses says of the man, woman, child, and even the stranger in their midst, that they may hear and that they may learn when they were all called together and the law read to them. Now this passage doesn't establish a pattern for the New Testament dispensation, admittedly, but it does point to the fact that God wanted it done that way in the former dispensation, and that such an arrangement made it more than possible for all to come to a good understanding of the law of God. And if that was the case then, it can just as easily be done that way today. If not, why not? So the argument that Sunday schools are necessary to adequately teach the Bible doesn't stand the test. Parents are charged with teaching their children, and families should be worshiping together when the church is called together for teaching and for worship. Well, what saith the New Testament about this? Did the early church come together only to be segregated into small groups for the purpose of being taught and edified? Well, first of all, notice that much of the same language is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that was used in Deuteronomy chapter 31. 
In verse 23, for example, the Apostle Paul says, if the whole church be come together into one place. Verse 26, he says, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. And then look at verse 31. For ye may all prophesy one by one, or one at a time, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. Now for the sake of brevity, I didn't read all of the verses in between, but I would certainly encourage you to do so. The idea is clearly set forth that when the church comes together, it's called together in one assembly. And that by following the rules for that assembly that Paul gives, that is, it being taught and edified by one man teaching at a time, the church as a whole can be edified. All can hear. All may be comforted. All could be built up in the faith. Uh, sinners could even be converted. And God would be glorified in all of this. Now notice that Paul said that all of the prophets present in that assembly could prophesy, but only one at a time. Not simultaneously, one at a time. And that all would learn as a result of those people teaching one at a time. Now consider what takes place in a Sunday school arrangement. There you have the church coming together only to divide up into separate assemblies with each class assigned a teacher without the oversight of elders in most cases or other church leaders in those classes. Those teachers simultaneously teach the groups assigned to them. What some learn in one class is not what others are necessarily learning in another class. But I ask again, is that the pattern that Paul puts forth in this chapter? The New Testament speaks in other places about the assembly of the church and it never so much as hints at the idea that the church was then divided into separate groups to be taught any more than it was divided for singing or praying or communing. The church did all of these things together. Acts 20 and verse 7 says that upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. Now would it be in keeping with the Bible design for the Lord's Supper? For the church to be called together only to divide into separate groups to commune? Well, that's not what happened in the first century church. Uh, the same language implies one assembly for teaching here and in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, Acts chapter 11 and verse 26 tells us that Barnabas and others assembled themselves with the church for a whole year and taught the people. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, we're instructed not to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Here Paul says, we are to assemble together for the purpose of exhorting one another to faithfulness. Now Bible classes, as practiced by churches today, create a situation and an arrangement that the Bible says nothing about. In fact, it is contrary to what the Bible does say. Paul spoke in Acts chapter 20 and verse 20 of teaching publicly, and then he said he taught from house to house. Now that tells us that there are two kinds of teaching that took place. Paul taught publicly. He taught them in the public place. He taught them when the church came together. And he taught them from house to house or in a private setting. So there are two kinds of teaching spoken of within the Bible. There's public teaching. And then there's what takes place in private or from house to house, from family to family. Now the only example of public teaching that we have is of one man speaking to an assembly of people. Now where would Bible classes fit into those two categories? They're not conducted by individuals from house to house, as Paul went from house to house teaching families. So they must be public, and indeed they are. They're public in every way. They're advertised to the public. Uh, church leaders call people together for these classes. Church leaders exhort people to attend them. They're under the oversight of the leadership of the church. So what is there about them that would even make them private? All are invited. All are even encouraged to come. They're not private, they're public. And more specifically, they are a method of assembling the church that the Bible says nothing about. Now, another rule governing that assembly involves the role of the Christian woman. Paul issues a pretty unpopular commandment beginning in verse 34 when he says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now here Paul forbids women from preaching or teaching in the assembly, and they're not even allowed to ask questions within the assembly. That's to be done in a private setting away from the assembly. 
1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12 says, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now when Paul says it is wrong, or he suffers not a woman to teach, he used a word there in the Greek text which refers to a speech or a public discourse. Now the Scriptures make allowance for a woman to teach others in a private, informal, one-on-one -on -one setting, such as when a mother teaches her children. Uh, such as when a believing wife instructs her unbelieving husband in the gospel. But what is forbidden here is a woman taking a public role in teaching God's Word. Now some falsely interpret this verse to be saying that a woman can teach publicly as long as she's not teaching a man. She can teach anybody in public, but she can't teach a man. But that's not what Paul is saying. For one thing, where a woman is allowed to teach by God's Word, she can teach anyone including, as I say, her unbelieving husband, according to 1 Corinthians 6 and verse, or 1 Corinthians 7 rather, in verse 16. So there's a case of a woman teaching a man, but it's in a private home type setting. Uh, men who are not her husband can be taught by a woman according to Acts chapter 18 and verse 26. That tells of the time that Priscilla and Aquila took Apollos, the teacher, into their home. They took him aside and into their home in a private setting to teach him the way of the Lord more perfectly. What Paul is condemning here is the practice of women teaching publicly. Now the prohibitions against her teaching and usurping authority of the man are separated by the disjunctive conjunction nor. That means that two things are being forbidden, a woman teaching in public and a woman usurping the authority of the man. Two things being forbidden. When a woman stands up and teaches a Sunday school class, she is publicly teaching the Bible, regardless of who's in her class. She's public to, publicly teaching the Bible. Whereas the Lord says that she is to learn in silence when the Word of God is being taught in public. Friend, is your church following the instruction of the Apostle Paul? Now, Lord willing, we'll talk more about that in greater detail next week. But I want to summarize with five points now. Number one, examples of any kind of public teaching under both Old and New Testaments always involve one undivided assembly. Again, you have house-to-house -house teaching in private, individuals on a private level. But then you have, when the church comes together, when teaching is done in a public way, it's always in one undivided assembly. Number two, Bible classes as practiced by churches today create a situation the Bible simply does not authorize. Number three, Paul said that women are not to teach publicly, nor to usurp authority over the man, and to be in silence when the word is being taught. Number four, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 instructs the women to keep silence in the churches because it is a shame for her to speak in the church or when the church is assembled. Number five, Bible classes are certainly public assemblies that would fall under the scope of these verses and thus by their very arrangement violate the principles contained in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Friends, the Sunday school arrangement was unheard of in the church for almost 1800 years. And it's not merely their modern date that makes them objectionable. It's the fact that they replaced God's design for the church assembly with something else. The question then today is, are we going to follow only what we can read in the Bible and be unquestionably right? Or are we going to follow the doctrines and practices of men? You can't go wrong following Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 for the assembly of the church. No one's questioning the good intentions of those who practice the Sunday school arrangement of teaching. I'm certainly not. I realize that most see it as an honest effort to teach people the Word of God, but ironically in doing so, it employs a method that is contrary to what the Bible teaches. And I'll be back in just a moment.
If you'd like to dig deeper into the Word of God, I'd like to provide you with a great opportunity to do that, and it's free. I hope to hear from you today enrolling in our Bible Correspondence course. You don't need to feel overwhelmed by the Bible. If you don't know how to study the Bible or where to begin in reading the Bible, this course will help get you on track, and it'll answer some very, very important and fundamental questions about the Bible and what the overall message is about. And uh, when you enroll in the course, we send out the first lesson. You take the time to read through it and answer the questions. You send it back to us. We'll uh, check it and send it back along with the next lesson in the course. You do it in the privacy of your home at your own pace. And again, it is free. So let us hear from you today, and we will enroll you in the Bible Correspondence course. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to see all of our past broadcasts, plus extra videos, including Let the Bible Speak classics all the way back to the 1960s. And get new updates, go to YouTube and search for Let the Bible Speak TV and click on subscribe. Lord willing, as we continue our series on innovations in the divine pattern, next week we'll look at the innovation of women preachers and teachers in the church. So I hope you'll join me for that. In the meantime, if you'd like a free printed transcript of our study today on the history of Sunday school, we'd be glad to send it to you free of charge. Just ask for it by the title Sunday School and we'll get it in the mail to you right away. We sure appreciate you for joining us on the broadcast today. We hope you'll make your plans to be right back here next time for another study of the Word of God. Look us up online at letthebiblespeak.tv. In the meantime, we'll see you next time. Until then, may God bless you. Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.